Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Wednesday evening devotional. This is Mike McDaniel, the evangelist of the Central Church of Christ in Carothersville, Missouri. It's a joy to be with you today. Now, hearts are heavy today because Sister Jean Gooden is not feeling well, is not doing well. I have been with her today, last night and today, at the hospital in Haiti. She's, she's not taking in sustenance and not as alert today as she was yesterday. So, I'm very concerned about her. The word is... Uh, when she's able, she will go back to, to Southgate soon. But that may not be for another day or two. So if you would, please pray with me for Sister Jean. Also, pray for our gospel meeting. You may have seen these around town. Uh, we have them around town at various locations. Uh, we are in the newspaper been advertising on radio, advertising on Channel 7, the usual ways we advertise. We've also sent it out to many congregations all throughout our region to let them know. And it's up to you to give these to a friend or family member and advertise our gospel meeting. This is July 31st through August the 2nd, so it's coming up. It's not this Sunday, but next Sunday. The theme, of course, Making a Difference for our Lord, and we have some great speakers, B.J. Clark, his son Michael Clark, Mike Hickson, John D. Berry. All of these have been with us before. You know them. You know what great men they are, great preachers. Uh, Michael filled in for me this year. That was his first time to be here, but everybody has been here. Brother D. Berry only once before. That was last year, and a lot of people talked about that and how much they enjoyed him. And we're thrilled to be able to have him back. So pray for our meeting. Encourage people to attend. I want to take a, a few moments today to talk about tools of Bible study. So a little bit a different kind of presentation today than normal. The Bible, of course, is the only book which has authority in religion, and in morality. Our commitment to the authority of the scriptures means that we reject all other books which pretend to be authoritative guides. This includes the manuals and the disciplines and the creeds of the different denominations. This is why we say no book but the Bible. There are, however, some books which are legitimate tools to help us in our study of the Scriptures. First of all, I want us to consider a concordance. A concordance is a book which alphabetically lists Bible words, and the verses where each word is found. This is useful for finding a passage when you know a key word in it, but do not know where the verse is located. Concordances are also important tools for comparing how a certain word is used in various places in the Bible. How to use a concordance is easy to learn. And this is one of the most valuable Bible study aids that we have. There are large exhaustive concordances which list every word and all the places where each word is found. The two best ones are Strong's Exhaustive Concordance and Young's New Analytical Concordance. There are also abridged concordances, which only list some of the more significant 
words and a few of the places in the Bible where they are found. Often abridged concordances are printed in the back of some editions of the Bible. Some concordances have the additional advantage of showing the different Hebrew and Greek words which have been translated into the same English word. There are also concordances that are based on specific versions of the Bible. For the average Christian, Cruden's abridged concordance is as good as any. In 1699, there was a son that was born to the house of Cruden in Aberdeen, Scotland. He attended school and graduated. He fell in love with a pretty girl, but she rejected him. He became greatly depressed and was under the heavy burden of mental illness for much of his life. For a while, he had to be confined. And when he was released, he went to London to become a proofreader and later served as the French reader to the Earl of Derby. His French was proofreader's French. And when he came to puzzling passages of words that were hard to pronounce, he would read them letter by letter and line by line. The Earl fired him. He opened a bookshop and became bookseller to the Queen and wrote the book known as Cruden's Complete Concordance. In generations of scholars, preachers, and critics have examined his work, they have found few errors in just two omissions. Huz is not mentioned as the brother of Buzz, nor the name of the powder of the apothecary, with which the bridegroom is anointed in the Song of Solomon. One day in 1770, friends found Alexander Cruden dead in his room, on his knees, his head fallen forward on an open Bible. We're indebted to Mr. Cruden, for he gave the world a valuable Bible study tool which has been a blessing to millions of people. Next, we have reference Bibles. They are designed to help you compare a certain passage with other passages containing the same word or theme. And this is done by notations beside or below a verse which refer to one or more related passages. Sometimes they are found in the center column, center column references. I don't like those as well, as far as where they are. I like them directly under the verbs, and that's the way they are in my Dixon New Analytical Study Bible, but I realize they're not, uh, you can't find Bibles with them under the verse very often. Now, we need to keep in mind that those cross-references have been determined by the publishers, and they represent no more than their opinions as to the connections between the passages. They may be very helpful, but they can be misleading. It's important that you study the passages and their contents for yourself. The same caution is needed regarding the notes and the helps found in some reference Bibles. Third Bible dictionaries are designed primarily to give historical facts and information on people, places, and things. Their purpose is not to define ordinary words. 
you can, for example, expect a, a, a Bible dictionary to have information about Solomon. But you would not find definitions of ordinary words like taught or commanded. Now, exceptions to that might be words that are used in an unusual sense in Scripture. There are several excellent Bible dictionaries available. One of the most used is one of the older ones, and I still like it. Smith's Bible Dictionary. Very good volume, and I have it close to me in my library. Of course, another book to be used, and which is found in most homes, is an English dictionary, such as Webster's. I have a, an English dictionary by Random House, the Random House Collegiate Dictionary. And I'll tell an anecdote about that. When I look at that, I think of Mom and Dad because they bought that with quality stamps. Some of you who are old enough know what quality stamps are. Young people would know that reference. But we went to a store in Redeemed Books of Quality Stamps in Jackson, Tennessee, and they purchased for me my Random House Collegiate Dictionary. I still have it. I still use it. It's a very fine dictionary. Now, we have to keep in mind that an English dictionary defines words according to how they're currently used and not how they're used in the Bible. One problem I would have with my Random House Collegiate Dictionary is due to the age of it, there are words that have changed meanings and have totally different meanings today than they did when my Random House Collegiate Dictionary were published. But it's also the case that even my Random House Collegiate Dictionary, when it came out, and I'm not sure what the year was for that, but that would have been, uh, it would have been early 1980s when I published it, when, it, when I bought it, purchased it. Um, it would have words with different definitions than how they're used in the Bible. Let me give you an example. A dictionary, I could pull mine down and look at it right now, but and it would probably do this. A dictionary might include sprinkling in its definition of baptism. Why? Because that's the way many people think of baptism. But that's not the way baptismos is to be translated. It's translated as to dip, to plunge, to immerse, not sprinkling. So it's necessary, therefore, to let the Bible define itself, as in Romans 6, 4, where baptism is a burial, and to consult Greek and Hebrew dictionaries, and those are called lexicons, which deal with the original languages in which the Bible was written. Another good book used by many Christians which take no knowledge of the Greek language to use is W. E. Vine's Expository Dictionary of New Testament Words. I often tell about Sister Virginia True, and I have on, um, on that wall in my office a cross-stitch picture of the Irish blessing. At the bottom it says VT. Well, that was Sister Virginia True. She cross-stitched that for me. Well, I think about Virginia because Virginia got her a Vines Expository Dictionary of New Testament Words. And she would come to Bible class. She had studied her lesson. She would speak up and say, Now, I looked that word up in my Vines Expository Dictionary of New Testament Words. And it said that word is to be defined as so-and-so. 
I heard her do that numerous times, much to my delight. She loved that book. And she had it handy with her Bible so she could learn what the words meant. Well, in that wonderful book, Sister Virginia could look up a biblical word and she could see the different Greek words that were used for that word and where they were found and what they mean. She knew that that book worked just like an English dictionary and she had no trouble at all in using it. Mr. William Mounts has published another book, Similar to Vines, which works the same way. And it's sort of a modern day update to Vines. But Vines is still very good. Commentaries are books in which the authors have sought to explain the meaning of Scripture. It's important to know the religious background of the author. In the majority of commentaries for sale, error is taught, sadly, concerning God's plan of salvation, concerning the church, concerning the worship, and in a whole lot of other areas. However, if we will recognize the error for what it is, some of these books can be helpful to us in other areas. Fortunately, in my lifetime, a great number of lectureship books have been written by our brethren in Christ. I have been fortunate enough to have been involved in that. And over the course of my preaching career, I have written numerous chapters for lectureship books that have been printed in various locations around the country. Of course, I've written for the Memphis School of Preaching Lectureship. I've written for the Spiritual Sword Lectureship in Memphis. I've written for the Power Lectures in South Haven, Mississippi. I have written for the, uh, the Lubbock Lectures from the Southside Church in Lubbock, Texas, and uh, two or three others. I have been blessed to have had the opportunity to write manuscripts that have been published uh, in these lectureship books. And I have a number of them uh, in my library, and they have been a blessing to the church. Now, we also have single paperback commentaries on various books of the Bible. Just to single out one, Brother Robert Taylor Jr. has done a tremendous job in that field. And currently, uh, my friend and, and former faculty member, fellow faculty member, Tom Waycaster, is, is now writing commentaries on Scripture. I've encouraged him to do all that he can to complete his set on the New Testament. I hope that God spares him so that he might be able to do that. But he's already put a great dent in that and written quite a number of commentaries. And he is famous for his commentaries on Psalms. Now we also have, of course, the Gospel Advocate commentary series on the New Testament. We also have Brother Burton, James Burton Kaufman's commentaries on the whole Bible. All of these can help us in our Bible study. Knowledge of the Word of God is essential in maintaining a proper relationship with God and others. Personal Bible study is very important. Now, our primary goal and purpose in life ought to be to assure our own salvation, and then after that, the salvation of other people. Those two are so related that in a very real sense, one is dependent on the other. In 1 Timothy 4, verses 12 through 16, Paul included both of those in his admonition to Timothy to faithfulness. He said, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. 1 Timothy 4, 12. And then the next verse, Paul adds, Till I come. 
give attendance to reading, to exhortation, and to doctrine. And then in verse 16 he said, Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Our Savior reminds us in Matthew 7, 21, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but whosoever doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. The will of the Father is set forth for us on the pages of the New Testament. Therefore, we need to become familiar with it if we are to be spiritually blessed. Paul also said to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Remember that prayer and Bible study go together. We cannot pray without realizing our weaknesses. And that prepares us to seek help from Jehovah God. And that makes us more ready to read God's directions to us in his word. We ought to thank God today for the blessing of his word and for the tools that are available to help us in our study of it. I pray that you'll accept God's will for your life and that you'll seek to teach his will to other people. Thanks so much for watching today. Hope you have a great day. Tune in next time. Have a good day.